Hey guys, welcome back to the Trading Coach Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Akil Stokes, Forex Trader and Trading Coach over at TierOneTrading.com. In today's episode, we're going to talk about a question I got from a trader about strategy development and about backtesting. He starts off by saying, hey Akil, maybe a question for another video or Trading Coach Podcast episode, but I'm a former tier one trading member who is likely going to join again in the near future as I'm keen to continue my trading journey. However, I am. it is clear that I will never be comfortable trading a discretionary style. And for you guys that are new, um, a discretionary style of trading is a trading style that allows for flexibility. So it's not as rigid as say like a mechanical system. There, there are loads of gray area in between, but typically you'll hear like discretionary trading as you know, a type of trader that is kind of more artsy. They get on the chart, they use their eyes, they interpret moves, they kind of make decisions off of what they feel and see. Um, well, maybe not feel, I'll take that back. They make decisions off of what they, I guess, feel is a term of intuition and see. A mechanical trader or a systems trader, an algo trader, again, there's, there's many different terms for it, is someone who's much more binary. So they're one zero, they are black and white, they are fully rules based. Uh, you see this a lot with um, indicator type traders where it's like, hey, if this crosses this, then look for that to go oversold. If that is oversold, then enter trade. Um, for me personally, while we're on the subject, I like a combination of both, right? So my job is to eliminate as much subjectivity from my trading as possible, but I do also like to leave some things up to interpretation because I do believe that trading is both an art and a science. So my personal style of trading is a discretionary style of trading that is highly rules based, meaning that if you can imagine there is a rule set for every single thing I must do in the market, there's a rule set for everything, every single thing I must see, there is a definition for everything that I'm coming across in the market and all of my trading decisions have to fit within that rule set. With that being said, there is a little bit of room for interpretation, meaning that like, you know, uh, analyzing an extension or a swing or something like that. There's going to be um, a little bit of subjectivity in there because I don't have specific rules on, hey, this counts as a pullback. So I, I do allow myself a little bit of freedom within that rules base. So don't think that you have to be fully one or fully other. I would definitely not advise fully being discretionary, especially if you're a newer trader, because most of that skill of being a discretionary trader is going to come from intuition and intuition is gained from experience. And when you're new, you don't have experience. So that's something that, you know, in my opinion, I think rules need to be loosened up over time or, or expanded upon is a better way of saying it. Um, but, you know, that that's up to you and your trading journey to kind of figure out which where you lie on that line. It's pretty cool that this trader through years of experience has come to the conclusion that, hey, this style of trading doesn't work for me. So I'm going to focus my full attention on this style. So he says, it's clear that I will not be comfortable trading in a discretionary style. My brain does not like subjectiveness and I do not trust my brain to see the same things in a consistent way. Again, knowing yourself as a trader, knowing yourself as a person. Um, you hear us talk about, you know, Jason Grayson and myself always talk about, you want to fit your trading around your lifestyle. You want to fit it around your personality. Those are examples of what we're talking about. He says, this leaves me with only being able to trade a very mechanical uh, style, pretty much robotic. Some may call it algo trading, I suppose. I've put in some serious hours per the attached trading, uh, uh, per the attachment to a trading breakout strategy of the London Open on the pound yen. Over a thousand trades from 2019 to 2023. Each year it wins as the strategy is based on the one hour time frame. Sometimes I need to drill down into a lower time frame to see if it wins or loses. So it looks like a, a multi time frame strategy. Um, however, there is a limit on how far trading view goes um, back in replay mode, in which case I have no certainty if the trades reach a target profit or a stop loss first. 
How would you manage this? So we'll tackle this first problem first. And basically the trader is using TradingView to do his back testing. TradingView has a, a really cool feature called market replay where basically you can hop in the time machine, you can go back in time and you can scroll through the markets as if they were happening live. You can set the speed so it's real time. So like if you're watching a, a five minute candle, it takes five minutes for that candle to print or you can kind of speed it up like many of you guys do for the podcast, do it at triple time or whatever, or you can kind of just click through. But it's a lot easier it's a lot easier way of back testing because it gets you used to uncertainty. It gets you used to having open chart space on the right hand side of your screen. So you have to make a decision before seeing the answer, which is very important. We, we've talked many times about the the kind of the downside of back testing and how even if we don't purposely mean it, sometimes we will subconsciously cheat in our testing because the whole point of our testing is to get a positive answer. So in a way we are looking for that positive answer and we will sabotage ourselves in order to get it. Um, this helps eliminate that. Now, the problem with trading view, and I've heard this time and time again, is that there is only a limited amount of space that you can go back. So TradingView is a brilliant platform. Um, it's a desktop and web-based platform now, www.tradingview.com. And I was fortunate enough to be there when TradingView first started. I was on the beta testing team where it was a brand new project. They sent it out to traders that they respected and they said, hey, tear this thing apart and let me know what you think. And throughout the years, I've just been very impressed. They've won a bunch of prizes as well in the, the tech space, but I've been very impressed at the changes they have made. However, because they are web-based, um, they don't hold, and I believe that's the reason because they're web-based, they don't hold as much data as, say, some other platforms. So you're limited in how far you can go back in your testing. Now, depending on your membership level, uh, that will depend on how far you can go back as well, I believe. So they have different membership deals um i don't know that you can look on their website to know the differences between the two or the, the different ones but i'm pretty sure if you're on a free membership you get less available data than if you're on i'm on whatever the premium thing is um i'm sure you get less data than that so one solution for that right is if you do a youtube search because we had a trader that i worked with do this as well if you do a youtube search on how to get more data on trading view there is a little hack out there now i don't know if trading view will or can or ever take this hack away but i would advise that you go to youtube you search how to get more data on trading view and there's this little hack where you got to do one thing to do another thing and do another thing and then boom more data opens up so if the problem isn't you need a higher membership try the hack a third solution is, and, and real quick, you know, because some people out there will be like, oh man, what do you mean I got to get a, a higher membership to do, to do blah, 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 blah. I don't want to pay money. Uh, my advice is don't be cheap, right? Understand this, right? If you are serious about trading, then you're treating trading like a business. And if you're serious about any business, you understand that a business is going to involve startup cost and operation costs, meaning that businesses cost money to operate, right? It doesn't matter what business you're in. You could be someone that knits sweaters. Guess what? You got to go out and buy material, right? There is a cost to everything. Fortunately, in trading, in comparison to the other businesses, and I've started different businesses in the past, the startup cost is very low. Typically, all you need is an internet connection, which most of you have already, Really, the only other thing you need, right, aside from trading capital, is a trading platform, right? So if you're someone that's on the ropes where it's like, yeah, you know, I, I could pay more for a higher membership, but I don't want to because I want to be cheap, I would question how serious you are about your trading because in, in the bigger scheme, it's not going to cost too much based on, you know, in comparison to what you plan on making. So don't be cheap. Get a, a, a bigger membership if you can. If not, try the hack. That could work at all, work as well. Last, uh, the last type of deal was you may need to be on a different platform, right? Um, you, may need, you may need to go to a different charting package, whether it's, a, a, I don't advise MetaTrader, but MetaTrader is a free one. I, I don't know anything about them. Um, I just, I, I'm not a big fan, but MetaTrader, you can go to a, a Ninja Trader. There are many different platforms out there. And before making that decision, ask them, hey, if I'm looking at historical data, because I plan on doing historical testing, 
how much historical data do I have access to? And that way you know that you have the ability to go back to whatever year you want to go back to. Um, and maybe it means staying with that platform forever. Maybe it means, hey, just opening an account on that platform simply so you can do the testing. And once you're done the testing, you cancel the membership or whatever and go back to TradingView. Again, this is a startup cost. This is uh, the back testing process and the, the strategy development process is a crucial part because you cannot make money in trading unless you go through this process. So if it costs a little bit of money to do it, that is just the cost of doing business. Write it off on your taxes. So that's a solution to that first question. The second second question is, says Akil, the other problem I have is that back testing does not take into account slippage, commissions, and spreads. On some trades, uh, price only just derives at target profit, and on others, it only just misses stop losses. A few winners that turn into losers could have a massive impact. I just have no idea if I'm creating blockers or if these are real concerns to have before putting my own money at risk. And yeah, these are certainly real concerns, right? Many traders, we talk about the, the cost of doing business. Um, the reality of trading is that there is going to be slippage commissions and spreads. So other fees that you pay, there may be rollover fees as well, depending on your duration of trading and, and, and what um, what trades you're in. But these are going to play a role because these are going to have an impact on your trading strategy. Now, the amount of impact they have, uh, that's going to depend on you as a trader, right? A, a lower time frame trader, they're going to have a bigger impact than someone that trades on the daily chart, right? If you trade in the daily chart, your, your slippage isn't going to be a big deal. Spread isn't going to be a big deal. If you're trading on a range bar chart or a one minute chart, you know, Spread can be, you know, 50% uh, of your, your profit target, right? Who knows, right? I've done strategies in the past where I've made this mistake. And this is why it's important important that you have a um, a good profit factor, right? So when, when you calculate your profit factor, right? And the profit factor is basically telling you if your your strategy is profitable or not. So what you typically do is you take your your average win times your win percentage, and then you subtract your average loss times the win percent or the loss percentage, excuse me, from that. So imagine like parentheses, average win times win percentage, right? Parentheses, then minus parentheses, average loss times loss percentage, and then the total of that. And hopefully that's gonna give you a number that's above one. And, and the higher that number is above one, the better your strategy, to the, the greater the edge your strategy has. So if you're someone that has a profit factor, let, let's say your, your deal is like, it, it's, a, it's, it's just a one, right? Or let's say it's like a 1.2, right? There's a good chance that when you do calculate in the, the reality of trading, your slippage commissions and spreads, it's going to take that somewhat profitable strategy and, and make it break even. I've, I've done this in the past, not taking that into account, where I've done strategies on the lower time frame and it worked great. And back testing was a very small margin for error, very small profit factor. But the frequency of trades, in my mind, I would just bang out as many trades as possible and exploit that edge, exploit that edge, exploit that edge. The problem was that when I started trading it live and I and I when I took on slippage, I had to pay spreads. It was, even though they weren't that much in the bigger picture, they were enough to significantly, or, or guess, uh, you know, decrease my edge enough that it became significant because now my small edge became no edge and I was basically break even. So you want to make sure that your, your strategy is profitable enough to withstand commissions, spreads, and slippage. And I, I would tell you this, if it's not, right, if you're at the point where spread and commissions are going to be the, the, the make or breaker between a strategy being profitable enough to trade and, and not profitable enough to trade, I would say that your strategy isn't profitable enough to trade, right? If you, if you truly have a profitable trading strategy, it should be so profitable that commissions and spreads don't make a big impact. So that, that, that is something that I would question. For the second part of that question, you know, you're going to have situations in backtesting where things, you know, maybe uh, uh, comes right to a price point, whether it's an entry, whether it's a target or whether it's a stop. What I always do is I always assume for the worse, right? So I always assume that, hey, if price comes right to my entry 
and turns around that in reality, I'm not going to be involved in that trade because of the spread, right? P price should go past your entry point by the spread. Same thing with targets. If price hits right on a target level and doesn't push past it and then reverses and does whatever, I'm going to assume that I'm not involved, right? I'm going to assume that I did not get triggered for my target and I'm going to count it as a loss or a break even or whatever my rules require. Same thing with stop loss. If price comes close to my stop loss, again, within that spread, because that's how these things work in real life. If price comes close to that stop loss on my um, back testing, I'm going to count it as a loss. So I always want to be pessimistic in my testing. I always want to prepare for the worst, because I'll tell you this. If I can prepare for the absolute worst, if I can take all those 50-50 those balls to insert my normal sports reference into the podcast, right? If I can take all those 50-50 balls and assume that they're going to be losers, if I can do that, if I can throw them all in the losing category, and if at the end of the day, if my system is still profitable, that is a good sign. Because again, those 50-50 chances aren't going to make or break my strategy, right? And I don't want to go into real trading with this overly optimistic view and then underperform because that's going to have a massive effect on my psyche. I'd rather go in with a what I consider a realistic view or a worst case scenario type of view and then outperform that because that's going to be better for my psyche and that's going to help avoid the rest of those psychological mistakes. So that's my advice for this. The rest of the email talked about the rules for the strategy. We're not going to go into that because I don't want to give this trader's rules away, but Hopefully this answered your question, Kevin, and well, I emailed you anyway, but hopefully this answers the question for any other Kevins out there that were thinking or pondering or wondering the same things. So I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. Hey, feel free to shoot me messages. Feel free to shoot me DMs. Uh, just like this trader here, I love answering trading questions. I'm a little bit of a nerd about this. You can do it through my email, akil at tier1trading.com, or you can hit me up on social media at Akil Stokes RTM. Just remember, if you're on social media, watch out for the scammers out there. If I ever reach out to you with a, a DM first and say, hey, how's your trading? Um, follow this link for blah, 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 blah. It is not me. Please report. Please shoot me a screenshot. That way I can share it as well and hopefully stop others from getting scammed. All right. Until next time, plan your trade. Trade your plan. Take care.